chapter sixteen of campaigning with grant by horace porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter sixteen a disappointed bandmaster hunter's raid early's raid on washington grant as a writer grant devotes attention to sherman grant's treatment of his generals grant's equanimity grant as a thinker why grant never swore meade and warren seward visits grant earthworks had been thrown across the neck of land upon which city point is located this entrenched line ran from a point on the james to a point on the appomattox river a small garrison had been detailed for its defence and the commanding officer wishing to do something that would afford the general-in-chief special delight arranged to send the band over to the headquarters camp to play for him while he was dining the garrison commander was in blissful ignorance of the fact that to the general the appreciation of music was a lacking sense and the musician's score a sealed book about the third evening after the band had begun its performances the general while sitting at the mess-table remarked i've noticed that that band always begins its noise just about the time i am sitting down to dinner and want to talk i offered to go and make an effort to suppress it and see whether it would obey an order to cease firing and my services were promptly accepted the men were gorgeously uniformed and the band seemed to embrace every sort of brass instrument ever invented from a diminutive cornet a piston to a gigantic double bass horn the performer who played the latter instrument was encaged within its ample twists and looked like a man standing inside the coils of a whisky still the broad-belted bandmaster was puffing with all the vigour of a quack medicine advertisement his eyes were riveted upon the music and it was not an easy task to attract his attention like a sperm whale he had come up to blow and was not going to be put down till he had finished but finally he was made to understand that like the hand-organ man he was desired to move on with a look of disinheritance on his countenance he at last marched off his band to its camp on my return the general said i fear that bandmaster's feelings have been hurt but i didn't want him to be wasting his time upon a person who has no ear for music a staff officer remarked well general you were at least much more considerate than commodore blank who the day he came to take command of his vessel and was seated at dinner in the cabin heard music on deck and immediately sent for the executive officer and said to him have the instruments and men of that band thrown overboard at once hunter's bold march and destruction of military stores had caused so much alarm that lee as has been said before was compelled to send breckinridge's force and early score to the valley of virginia hunter continued to drive back the troops he encountered till he reached lynchburg there he found that the strength of the works and the combined forces brought against him would prevent the further success of his raid on june eighteen he decided to exercise the discretion which had been left him in such a contingency and retire toward his base the result of the campaign besides compelling lee to detach troops from his own army was the burning of confederate cloth mills gunstock and harness factories and foundries engaged in the manufacture of ammunition the destruction of about fifty miles of railroad and the capture of three thousand muskets twenty pieces of artillery and a quantity of ammunition the stringent orders given by grant to siegel and by him turned over to hunter who had succeeded him were prepared with a view to preventing all wanton destruction they were in part as follows indiscriminate marauding should be avoided nothing should be taken not absolutely necessary for the troops except when captured from an armed enemy impressments should be made under orders from the commanding officer and by a dispersing officer receipts should be given for all property taken so that the loyal may collect pay and the property be accounted for notwithstanding these orders there were some houses burned and damage done to individual property during this raid hunter having been compelled to fall back into west virginia the roads to washington were left uncovered and the enemy now advanced into maryland siegel's small force retreated precipitately across the potomac followed by the enemy 
it had been impossible for general grant to obtain any reliable news for a number of days in regard to these movements and it was not until the fourth of july that he received definite information he did not find many leisure moments to indulge in patriotic demonstrations at headquarters on independence day for the directions for executing the plans for checkmating the enemy in his present movement fully occupied every one on duty grant telegraphed to halleck to concentrate all the troops about washington baltimore cumberland and harper's ferry bring up hunter's troops and put early to flight while grant was thinking only of punishing early there was great consternation in washington and the minds of the officials there seemed to be occupied solely with measures for defending the capital hunter's troops had fallen back to charleston west virginia and a drought had left so little water in the ohio river that the ascent of the vessels on which his troops had embarked was greatly delayed all eyes were as usual turned upon grant to protect the capital and drive back the invading force on july fifth seeing as he thought another opportunity for cutting off and destroying the troops that lee had detached from his command grant ordered one division of wright's corps and some dismounted cavalry to washington by steamers under subsequent orders the infantry division ricketts proceeded via baltimore to reinforce general lew wallace at the monocacy general grant had been very much dissatisfied with all of siegel's movements and now that the situation was becoming somewhat serious he determined to make an effort to have him removed from his command on the seventh he sent halleck a dispatch saying i think it advisable to relieve him siegel from all duty at least until present troubles are over siegel was immediately removed and general howe put in command of his forces until hunter's arrival by means of the telegraphic communications which he constantly received grant was able to time pretty well the movements of the enemy and to make preparations for meeting him before he could attempt the capture of washington he had been planning some important offensive operations in front of richmond but he now decided to postpone these and turn his chief attention to early the nineteenth corps which had been ordered from new orleans by sea and which was now arriving at fort monroe and the remainder of wright's sixth corps from in front of petersburg were instructed to proceed at once to washington instead of sympathizing with the alarming messages from the capital and the many rash suggestions made from there the general telegraphed on july nine forces enough to defeat all that early has with him should get in his rear south of him and follow him up sharply leaving him to go north defending depots towns etc with small garrisons and the militia if the president thinks it advisable that i should go to washington in person i can start in an hour after receiving notice the president answered saying that he thought it would be well for the general to come to washington but making it only as a suggestion general grant replied to this i think on reflection it would have a bad effect for me to leave here and with ord at baltimore and hunter and wright with the forces following the enemy up could do no good i have great faith that the enemy will never be able to get back with much of his force the general said in conversation with his staff on the tenth one reason why i do not wish to go to washington to take personal direction of the movement against early is that this is probably just what lee wants me to do in order that he may transfer the seat of war to maryland or feel assured that there will be no offensive operations against petersburg during my absence and detach some of his forces and send them against sherman sherman is at a long distance from his base of supplies and i want to be able to have him feel that i shall take no step that will afford an opportunity of detaching troops from here to operate against him general lew wallace in command of what was called the middle department made a gallant stand at the monocacy and effected a delay in the enemy's movements toward washington but his small force was of course defeated early now moved directly on washington and on july eleven advanced upon the outer line of fortifications but to the surprise of his troops they saw the well-known banners of the sixth corps and found that washington instead of being weakly defended was now guarded by veterans of the army of the potomac early discovered that he had been outmanoeuvred and on the night of the twelfth began a retreat 
grant had now but one anxiety which was to have an efficient head selected for the command of the troops that he was collecting to operate against early he sent a dispatch to halleck saying give orders assigning major-general wright to supreme command of all troops moving out against the enemy regardless of the rank of other commanders he should get outside the trenches with all the force he possibly can and should push early to the last moment supplying himself from the country the next day july thirteenth wright moved forward with his command following up early there had been several days of serious perplexity and annoyance at headquarters the commanders had to be changed and the best results possible obtained with the material at hand twice the wires of the telegraph line were broken and important messages between washington and city point had to be sent a great part of the way by steamboat it was rumored at one time that hill's corps had been detached from lee's front and there was some anxiety to know whether it had been sent to early or to johnston who was opposing sherman but the rumor was soon found to be groundless grant's orders now were to press the enemy in maryland with all vigor to make a bold campaign against him and destroy him if possible before he could return to lee early however had gained a day's start and although a number of his wagons and animals and some prisoners had been captured no material damage was inflicted upon him on july twenty he reached snicker's ferry and the chase was abandoned early continued his march to strasburg where he arrived july twenty second the general had occupied himself continually during this anxious and exciting period in giving specific instructions by wire and messengers to meet the constantly changing conditions which were taking place from day to day and from hour to hour in the theatre of military operations and no dispatches were ever of greater importance than those which were sent from headquarters at this time his powers of concentration of thought were often shown by the circumstances under which he wrote nothing that went on around him upon the field or in his quarters could distract his attention or interrupt him sometimes when his tent was filled with officers talking and laughing at the top of their voices he would turn to his table and write the most important communications there would then be an immediate hush and abundant excuses offered by the company but he always insisted upon the conversation going on and after a while his officers came to understand his wishes in this respect to learn that noise was apparently a stimulus rather than a check to his flow of ideas and to realize that nothing short of a general attack along the whole line could divert his thoughts from the subject upon which his mind was concentrated in writing his style was vigorous and terse with little of ornament its most conspicuous characteristic was perspicuity general meade's chief of staff once said there is one striking feature about grant's orders no matter how hurriedly he may write them in the field no one ever has the slightest doubt as to their meaning or ever has to read them over a second time to understand them the general used anglo-saxon words much more frequently than those derived from the greek and latin tongues he had studied french at west point and picked up some knowledge of spanish during the mexican war but he could not hold a conversation in either language and rarely employed a foreign word in any of his writings his adjectives were few and well chosen no document which ever came from his hands was in the least degree pretentious he never laid claim to any knowledge he did not possess and seemed to feel with addison that pedantry in learning is like hypocrisy in religion a form of knowledge without the power of it he rarely indulged in metaphor but when he did employ a figure of speech it was always expressive and graphic as when he spoke of the commander at bermuda hundred being in a bottle strongly corked or referring to our enemies at one time moving like horses in a bulky team no two ever pulling together his style inclined to the epigrammatic without his being aware of it there was scarcely a document written by him from which brief sentences could not be selected fit to be said in mottoes or placed upon transparencies as examples may be mentioned i propose to move immediately upon your works i shall take no backward steps the famous i propose to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer and later in his career let us have peace 
the best means of securing the repeal of an obnoxious law is its vigorous enforcement i shall have no policy to enforce against the will of the people and let no guilty man escape he wrote with the first pen he happened to pick up and never stopped to consider whether it was sharp-pointed or blunt-nibbed good or bad he was by no means as particular in this regard as general zachary taylor of whom an old army rumor said that the only signature he ever made which was entirely satisfactory to him was written with the butt end of a ramrod dipped in tar general grant's desk was always in a delirious state of confusion pigeon-holes were treated with a sublime disregard and he left his letters piled up in apparently inextricable heaps but strange to say he carried in his mind such a distinct recollection of local literary geography as applied to his writing-table that he could go to it and even in the dark lay his hand upon almost any paper he wanted his military training had educated him to treat purely official documents with respect and these were always handed over to colonel bowers the adjutant general to be properly filed but as to his private letters he made his coat pockets a general depository for his correspondence until they could hold no more and then he discharged their contents upon his desk in a chaotic mass the military secretaries made heroic struggles to bring about some order in this department and generally saw that copies were kept of all letters of importance which the chief wrote whatever came from his pen was grammatically correct well punctuated and seldom showed an error in spelling in the field he never had a dictionary in his possession and when in doubt about the orthography of a word he was never known to write it first on a separate slip of paper to see how it looked he spelled with heroic audacity and chanced it on the correctness while in rare instances he made a mistake in doubling the consonants where unnecessary or in writing a single consonant where two were required he really spelled with great accuracy his pronunciation was seldom if ever at fault though in two words he had a peculiar way of pronouncing the letter d he always pronounced corduroy corduroy and immediately immediately while planning means for the defeat of early general grant was still giving constant attention to the movements of sherman that officer had been repulsed in making his attack on kennesaw mountain but by a successful flank movement had turned the enemy's very strong position and compelled him to fall back over the chattahoochee river on july four on the seventeenth sherman crossed that river and drove the enemy into his defences about atlanta it now looked as if sherman would be forced to a siege of that place and as he was many hundreds of miles from his base and there was only a single line of railroad to supply him it was more than ever important that no troops should be allowed to leave virginia to be thrown against his lines grant was frequently in consultation with meade in regard to preventing the enemy from withdrawing troops from petersburg the southern papers received through the lines gave very conflicting accounts of the operations on sherman's front and indicated that there was a great demand for the reinforcement of johnston and expressed the belief that there would be vigorous movements made to break sherman's communications in a dispatch to halleck grant said if he sherman can supply himself with ordnance and quartermaster's stores and partially with subsistence he will find no difficulty in staying until a permanent line can be opened with the south coast the general directed a large quantity of the stores at nashville to be transferred to chattanooga there was another contingency which he mentioned and which he had to devise steps to guard against a determination on the part of the enemy to withdraw the troops in front of sherman and move them quickly by rail to petersburg and in the meantime march early's corps back to lee and make a combined attack upon the army of the potomac this grant believed would be done only in some extreme emergency and in case the enemy felt convinced that sherman was so far from his base of supplies that he could not move much farther into the interior one means which the general-in-chief had in contemplation at this time for preventing troops from being sent from virginia was to start sheridan on a raid to cut the railroads southwest of richmond 
important news reached headquarters on july seventeenth to the effect that general joe johnston had been relieved from duty and general hood put in command of the army opposed to sherman general grant said when he received this information i know very well the chief characteristics of hood he is a bold dashing soldier and has many qualities of successful leadership but he is an indiscreet commander and lacks cool judgment we may look out now for rash and ill-advised attacks on his part i am very glad from our standpoint that this change has been made hood will prove no match for sherman he waited with some curiosity to know just what policy hood would adopt as was anticipated he came out of his lines and made an attack on july twenty but was repulsed with great loss he made another offensive movement on the twenty second and fought the celebrated battle of atlanta but was again driven back on the twenty eighth he made another bold dash against sherman but in this also he was completely defeated and fell back within the defences at atlanta in the battle of the twenty second general mcpherson was killed when this news reached general grant he was visibly affected and dwelt upon it in his conversations for the next two or three days mcpherson he said was one of my earliest staff officers and seemed almost like one of my own family at donelson shiloh vicksburg and chattanooga he performed splendid service i predicted from the start that he would make one of the most brilliant officers in the service i was very reluctant to have him leave my staff for i disliked to lose his services there but i felt that it was only fair to him to put him in command of troops where he would be in the line of more rapid promotion i was very glad to have him at the head of my old army of the tennessee his death will be a terrible loss to sherman for i know that he will feel it as keenly as i mcpherson was beloved by everybody in the service both by those above him and by those below him in the midsummer of eighteen sixty four general grant had an increasing weight of responsibility thrown upon him every day while he was requiring his commanders to sleep with one foot out of bed and with one eye open lest lee might make some unexpected movement which would require a prompt change in the general plan of operations he had to devise new methods almost daily to check raids in different parts of the country protect the capital save the north from invasion and lay vigorous siege to petersburg which had been rendered as nearly impregnable by the enemy as the art of the military engineer was capable of making it he was constantly embarrassed too by some of his subordinates an acrimonious personal warfare was progressing between butler and w f smith and the latter's severe criticisms of meade had aroused the resentment of that officer which added a new phase to the general quarrel general grant finally made up his mind to relieve general smith from duty he was given a leave of absence and never recalled as a commander general butler had not been general grant's choice the general-in-chief when he assumed command of the armies found butler in charge of the department of virginia and north carolina and utilized him to the best advantage possible he had always found him subordinate prompt to obey orders possessed of great mental activity and clear in his conception of the instructions given him he was a good administrative officer though often given to severe and unusual methods in enforcing discipline and in dealing with the dissatisfied element of the population living within his department yet he did not possess the elements necessary to make an efficient officer in the field as he was inexperienced in fighting battles grant felt reluctance to give him charge of any important military movement one embarrassment was that he was the senior officer in rank in virginia and if general grant should be called away temporarily butler would be in supreme command of the operations against petersburg the general struggled along under this embarrassment by keeping matters under his own direction when butler's forces were employed in actual battle and by sending an experienced corps commander to handle the troops in the immediate presence of the enemy general meade's irritability of temper and oversensitiveness to implied censure or criticism on the part of the newspapers led him at one time to tender his resignation as commander of the army of the potomac general grant talked to him very kindly on the subject 
soothed his feelings and induced him to reconsider his intention the general-in-chief did not mention the matter publicly and was very glad that hasty action had been prevented if meade had resigned at this time hancock would have succeeded him and engels who had shown such signal executive ability might possibly have been given an important command engels and i expressed a desire repeatedly to serve in command of troops as such service gave promise of more rapid promotion and was more in accordance with our tastes but the general always insisted upon retaining us on his staff footnote a reference to this subject occurs in around the world with general grant by the hon john russell young who accompanied him upon his tour the language used by general grant in one of his interviews with mr young is reported as follows ingalls in command of troops would in my opinion have become a great and famous general horace porter was lost in the staff like ingalls he was too useful to be spared but as a commander of troops porter would have risen in my opinion to a high command editor and note general meade was a most accomplished officer he had been thoroughly educated in his profession and had a complete knowledge of both the science and the art of war in all its branches he was well read possessed of a vast amount of interesting information had cultivated his mind as a linguist and spoke french with fluency when foreign officers visited the front they were invariably charmed by their interviews with the commander of the army of the potomac he was a disciplinarian to the point of severity was entirely subordinate to his superiors and no one was more prompt than he to obey orders to the letter in his intercourse with his officers the bluntness of the soldier was always conspicuous and he never took pains to smooth any one's ruffled feelings there was an officer serving in the army of the potomac who had formerly been a surgeon one day he appeared at meade's headquarters in a high state of indignation and said general as i was riding over here some of the men in the adjoining camps shouted after me and called me old pills and i would like to have it stopped meade just at that moment was not in the best possible frame of mind to be approached with such a complaint he seized hold of the eyeglasses conspicuously large in size which he always wore clapped them astride of his nose with both hands glared through them at the officer and exclaimed well what of that how can i prevent it why i hear that when i rode out the other day some of the men called me a damned old goggle-eyed snapping turtle and i can't even stop that the officer had to content himself with this explosive expression of a sympathetic fellow-feeling and to take his chances thereafter as to obnoxious epithets in a view of the want of harmony which often prevailed the service would have suffered severely if an officer of a different character had been in supreme command but grant was so complacent in his manner so even in temper and so just in his method of dealing with the conflicting interests and annoying questions which arose that whatever his subordinates may have thought of one another to him they were at all times well disposed and perfectly loyal throughout this memorable year the most important as well as the most harassing of his entire military career general grant never in any instance failed to manifest those traits that were the true elements of his greatness he was always calm amid excitement and patient under trials he looked neither to the past with regret nor to the future with apprehension when he could not control he endured and in every great crisis he could convince when others could not advise his calmness of demeanour and unruffled temper were often a marvel even to those most familiar with him in the midst of the most exciting scenes he rarely raised his voice above its ordinary pitch or manifested the least irritability whether encountered at noonday or awakened from sleep at midnight his manner was always the same whether receiving the report of an army commander or of a private soldier serving as a courier or a scout he listened with equal deference and gave it the same strict attention he could not only discipline others but he could discipline himself if he had lived in ancient days he might in his wrath have broken the two tables of stone he would never have broken the laws which were written on them. 
the only manifestation of anger he had indulged in during the campaign was upon the occasion herein before mentioned when he found a teamster beating his horses near the totopotomy he never criticized an officer harshly in the presence of others if fault had to be found with him it was never made an occasion to humiliate him or wound his feelings the only pointed reprimand he ever administered was in the instance mentioned in the battle of the wilderness when an officer left his troops and came to him to magnify the dangers which were to be feared from lee's methods of warfare the fact that he never nagged his officers but treated them all with consideration led them to communicate with him freely and intimately and he thus gained much information which otherwise he might not have received to have a well-disciplined command he did not deem it necessary to have an unhappy army his ideas of discipline did not accord with those of the russian officer who one night in the moscow campaign reprimanded a soldier for putting a ball of snow under his head for a pillow for the reason that indulgence in such uncalled-for luxuries would destroy the high character of the army it was an interesting study in human nature to watch the general's actions in camp he would sit for hours in front of his tent or just inside of it looking out smoking a cigar very slowly seldom with a paper or a map in his hands and looking like the laziest man in camp but at such periods his mind was working more actively than that of any one in the army he talked less and thought more than any one in the service he studiously avoided performing any duty which some one else could do as well or better than he and in this respect demonstrated his rare powers of administration and executive methods he was one of the few men holding high position who did not waste valuable hours by giving his personal attention to petty details he never consumed his time in reading over court-martial proceedings or figuring up the items of supplies and hand or writing unnecessary letters or communications he held subordinates to a strict accountability in the performance of such duties and kept his own time for thought it was this quiet but intense thinking and the well-matured ideas which resulted from it that led to the prompt and vigorous action which was constantly witnessed during this year so pregnant with events he changed his habits somewhat at this period about going to bed early and began to sit up later and as he preferred to have some one keep him company and discuss matters with him of an evening one of the staff officers always made it a point not to retire until the chief was ready for bed many a night now became a sort of watch night with us but the conversations held upon these occasions were of such intense interest that they amply compensated for the loss of sleep they caused even after a hard day's ride at the front the general however did not always curtail the eight hours of rest which his system seemed to require for he often pieced out the time by lying in bed later in the morning when there was no stirring movement afoot while sitting with him at the campfire late one night after every one else had gone to bed i said to him general it seems singular that you have gone through all the rough and tumble of army service and frontier life and have never been provoked into swearing i have never heard you utter an oath or use an imprecation well somehow or other i never learned to swear he replied when a boy i seemed to have an aversion to it and when i became a man i saw the folly of it i have always noticed too that swearing helps to rouse a man's anger and when a man flies into a passion his adversary who keeps cool always gets the better of him in fact i could never see the use of swearing i think it is the case with many people who swear excessively that it is a mere habit and that they do not mean to be profane but to say the least it is a great waste of time his example in this respect was once quoted in my hearing by a member of the christian commission to a teamster in the army of the potomac in the hope of lessening the volume of rare oaths with which he was italicizing his language and upon which he seemed to be placing his main reliance in moving his mule team out of a mud hole the only reply evoked from him was then thar's one thing sartin the old man never druv mules on july twenty second general grant called upon the aides to go with him to meade's headquarters 
soon after our arrival there meade mounted his horse and rode out with us to visit warren the meeting between meade and warren was not very cordial in consequence of a rather acrimonious discussion and correspondence which had just taken place between them but they were both such good soldiers that they did not make any display of their personal feelings while engaged in their official duties a pittsburgh newspaper had stated that meade had preferred charges against warren for disobedience and tardy execution of orders warren at once wrote to meade asking him what truth there was in it and if the rumor was correct that he had told general grant that he had threatened him warren with a court-martial if he did not resign meade replied denying the statement of the newspaper but said he had been offended by the temper and ill-feeling that warren had manifested against him recently in the presence of subordinates and the want of harmony and cooperation which he had exhibited and that he had spoken to grant about this and had gone so far as to write a letter to him asking that warren might be relieved but that in the hope that disagreements might not occur in future and in order to avoid doing him so serious an injury he had withheld the letter a thorough examination of warren's front and other parts of the line was made sharp firing occurred in front of burnside which was thought to indicate something of importance but it was only a random fusillade on the part of the troops kept up between the parts of the lines which were quite close together saturday july twenty three william h seward the secretary of state came down from washington to visit general grant and see the armies he arrived at seven o'clock in the morning on the steamer city of hudson and came at once to general grant's quarters the general had seen but little of the distinguished secretary of state previous to this time and was very glad to welcome him to city point and make his more intimate acquaintance he presented the officers of the staff who were in camp at the time and invited them to take seats under the tent fly in front of his quarters where he and the secretary were sitting mr seward was profuse in his expressions of congratulation at the progress which had been made by the union armies in the east and their successes generally throughout the country we soon began to realize that he fully merited his reputation as a talker he spoke very freely in reference to the progress of the war and more particularly about our foreign relations he had conducted our many delicate negotiations with foreign nations with such consummate ability that every one was anxious to draw him out in regard to them the first topic of conversation which came up was the unfriendliness of our relations with england the first year of the war and especially how near we came to an open break with that power in regard to the trent affair in which commodore wilkes commanding the u s s san jacinto had taken slidell and mason the confederate emissaries from the english vessel trent upon which they were passengers mr seward said the report first received from the british government gave a most exaggerated account of the severity of the measures which had been employed but i found from commodore wilkes's advices that the vessel had not been endangered by the shots fired across her bows as charged that he had simply sent a lieutenant and a boat's crew to the british vessel that none of the crew even went aboard that the lieutenant used only such a show of force as was necessary to convince the contraband passengers he wanted that they would have to go with him aboard the san jacinto the books on international law were silent on the subject as to exactly how an act such as this should be treated and as our relations abroad were becoming very threatening we decided after a serious discussion that whatever was to be done should be done promptly and that under all the circumstances it would be wise and prudent to release the prisoners captured rather than contend for a principle which might not have been sound and run the risk of becoming involved in a war with great britain at that critical period the great desire of the davis government was to have this incident embroil us in such a war and we were not anxious to please it in that respect our decision in the matter was the severest blow the confederacy received in regard to its hope of assistance from abroad this naturally led to the mention of a more recent event upon the seas the destruction of the alabama by the kearsarge 
general grant had rejoiced greatly at this triumph of our sister service the navy and admired immensely the boldness and pluck exhibited by winslow the commander of the kearsarge in forcing the fight with the confederate cruiser the general was naturally delighted for it showed that winslow was a man after his own heart who acted upon the commendable military maxim when in doubt fight mr seward was asked whether he had in contemplation any steps to take england to task for the action of the british yacht deerhound for picking up and carrying off our prisoners he said i have communicated with our minister at london directing him to lay before the british government our grievance in this matter i feel pretty well convinced that the captain of the deerhound had arranged with sims the captain of the alabama previous to the fight to transfer to the yacht certain monies and valuables which sims had aboard so as to carry them to england for him and to occupy a position during the fight near enough to render assistance under certain contingencies it was reported that captain winslow asked the captain of the deerhound to rescue the crew of the alabama who were drowning when that vessel was sinking but that did not seem to be necessary as winslow was able with his boats to rescue all the men it appears that many of sims's guns were manned by british gunners and the wounded who were picked up were carried to england and cared for in a british naval hospital the circumstance is a most aggravating one and we have given great britain to understand that such acts will not be tolerated in future by this nation general grant then brought up the subject of the empire in mexico which was supported by louis napoleon the general's services in the mexican war had made him thoroughly well acquainted with mexico and he not only had deep sympathy for her people in their present struggle but was a staunch supporter of the monroe doctrine generally and was opposed on principle to any european monarchy forcing its institutions upon an american republic mr seward expressed himself at great length upon this subject saying among other things i have had a very exhaustive correspondence on this subject with louis napoleon's ministry he has tried by every form of argument to justify his acts but i have insisted from the start that when an american state has established republican institutions no foreign power has the right to use force in attempting to subvert the government formed by its people and set up a monarchy in its place when an american republic becomes a monarchy by the voluntary act of its people the matter is no affair of ours as the people are always the rightful source of authority but in the present instance a european emperor has stepped in to deprive the mexicans of the right of republican freedom i have been insisting very forcibly that louis napoleon must withdraw his army from mexico why rumors have reached us from time to time that his forces were to advance across the rio grande by an understanding with the davis government and take possession of the state of texas we shall never feel easy until those troops are withdrawn general grant said while we don't want another war on our hands before we finish the present one yet i feel that the re-establishment of republican government in mexico would really be a part of our present struggle as soon as the war of secession ends and i think it is coming to a close pretty rapidly we will have a veteran army in the west ready to make a demonstration upon the rio grande with a view to enforcing respect for our opinions concerning the monroe doctrine i regard this expedition to mexico not as a movement of the french people but as one of the ambitious schemes of louis napoleon which shows that he has as little respect for the french people's opinions as for our own the french people are our old allies it is natural that we should have a great regard for them and there is a very close bond of sympathy between the two countries but louis napoleon does not represent the people of france i hope that his power may some day cease and that france may become a republic and i do not think that day is far distant mr seward remarked yes we want to get napoleon out of mexico but we don't want any war over it we have certainly had enough of war one of the party remarked to mr seward that he always seemed to have an abiding faith in the triumph of the union cause 
the secretary replied yes though we have passed through many gloomy periods since the breaking out of the war i have always felt confident that the integrity of the union would be preserved it is a part of my philosophy to believe that the american republic has now and will have for many years to come enough virtue in its people to ensure the safety of the state sometimes there does not seem to be any virtue to spare but there's always enough after some further conversation mr seward by invitation of general grant visited some of the nearest camps and in the afternoon general butler accompanied the secretary on his steamer on a trip up the james river as far as it was safe to go mr seward was urged to prolong his visit but as he had an engagement to be in norfolk in the evening he felt compelled to start for that place in the afternoon as soon as his steamer returned from the excursion up the james End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of campaigning with grant by horace porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen preparing the petersburg mine exploding the mine grant's adventures between the lines failure of the assault at the mine a new command for sheridan an infernal machine exploded near headquarters at this time the general-in-chief was devoting much of his attention to the planning of an important movement in connection with the explosion of the famous petersburg mine which had now been completed the operations attending it were novel and interesting though the result was the greatest disaster which occurred during the siege of petersburg after the assaults on the seventeenth and eighteenth of june burnside's corps established a line of earthworks within one hundred yards of those of the enemy in rear of his advanced position was a deep hollow in front the ground rose gradually until it reached an elevation on which the confederate line was established colonel pleasance commanding the forty eighth pennsylvania regiment composed largely of miners conceived the idea of starting a gallery from a point in the hollow which was concealed from the enemy's view pushing it forward to a position under his earthworks and there preparing a mine large enough to blow up the parapets and make a sufficiently wide opening for assaulting columns to rush through before the end of june he communicated the project to burnside who talked the matter over with general meade it was then submitted to general grant for his action this point of the line was in some respects unfavorable for an assault but it was not thought well to check the zeal of the officer who had proposed the scheme and so an authorization was given for the undertaking to continue there was a main gallery five hundred and eleven feet long and four and a half feet square and two lateral galleries the terminus was under the enemy's parapet and at a depth of about twenty-three feet below the surface of the ground these preparations were completed july twenty third and the mine was soon after charged with eight thousand pounds of powder and made ready for use a movement preliminary to the explosion was begun on july twenty sixth that required the exercise of much ingenuity and good generalship and which the general-in-chief had planned with great care it involved making a feint against richmond which should be conducted with such a show of serious intention that it would induce lee to throw a large portion of his command to the north side of the james and leave the works at petersburg so depleted that the movement on burnside's front would have in its favor many chances of success hancock's corps drew out from its position on the afternoon of the twenty sixth and made a rapid night march to deep bottom on the north side of the james and was followed by sheridan with the cavalry this entire force was placed under hancock's command on the morning of the twenty seventh it advanced and captured a battery of rifled guns i had been sent to hancock that morning and found him with his troops lying upon the grass with some of his staff during a lull in the firing i threw myself on the ground beside him while we conversed in regard to the situation and informed him that general grant would be with him some hours later suddenly firing broke out again in front and we all sprang to our feet to mount our horses hancock wore a thin blue flannel blouse and as i rose up one of my spurs caught in the sleeve and ripped it open from wrist to elbow 
i felt not a little chagrined to find that i was the means of sending this usually well-dressed corps commander into battle with his sleeves slit open and dangling in the air and made profuse apologies there was not much time for words but hancock treated the matter so good-naturedly in what he said in reply that he at once put my mind at ease general grant rode out on the field in the afternoon arriving there at half-past three o'clock for the purpose of determining upon the spot what the possibilities were on that side of the river before giving directions for carrying out the rest of his plans lee was now rushing troops to the north side of the james to reinforce the defences of richmond the next morning july twenty eighth sheridan while moving around the enemy's left was vigorously assaulted by a large body of infantry and driven back a short distance but he promptly dismounted his men made a determined counter-attack and drove the enemy back in confusion capturing two hundred and fifty prisoners and two stands of colors this engagement was called the battle of darbytown now that grant had satisfied himself that more than half of lee's command had been sent to the north side of the james he made preparations to throw hancock's corps again in front of petersburg and carry out his intended assault upon that front it was decided that the attack should be made at daylight on the morning of the thirtieth in the meantime in order to keep up the deception and detain the enemy on the north side of the river many clever ruses were resorted to in which the general-in-chief's ingenuity and rare powers of invention were displayed to the greatest advantage meade and ord were directed to cease all artillery firing on the lines in front of petersburg and to conceal their guns with a view to convincing the enemy that the troops were moving away from that position hancock withdrew one of his divisions quietly on the night of the twenty eighth and moved it back while he remained with his two other divisions north of the james until the night of the twenty ninth so as still to keep up the feint on the twenty eighth sheridan had the pontoon bridge covered with moss grass and earth to prevent the tramping of horses from being heard and quietly moved a division of his cavalry to the south side of the james he then dismounted his men concealed his horses and marched back by daylight so that the enemy would suppose that infantry was still moving to the north side a train of empty wagons was also crossed to that side in sight of the enemy steamboats and tugs were sent up the river at night to the pontoon bridges and ordered to show their lights and blow their whistles for the purpose of making the enemy believe that we were transferring troops to the north side these manoeuvres were so successful that they detained the enemy north of the james all day on the twenty ninth immediately after dark that evening the whole of hancock's corps withdrew stealthily from deep bottom followed by the cavalry on the morning of the thirtieth lee was holding five-eighths of his army on the north side of the james in the belief that grant was massing the bulk of his troops near deep bottom while he had in reality concentrated his forces in the rear of burnside at a point fifteen miles distant ready to break through the defences at petersburg on the afternoon of july twenty nine the general-in-chief proceeded with his staff to burnside's front and bivouacked near the centre of his line to give final instructions and to be upon the spot when the assault should be made burnside had been carefully instructed to prepare his parapets and abatis in advance for the passage of his assaulting columns so that when daylight came the troops would have no obstacles in their way in moving to the attack rapidly and with a strong formation ord had been moved to a position in burnside's rear burnside had proposed to put ferraro's colored troops in advance but meade objected to this as they did not have the experience of the white troops and in this decision he was sustained by grant and white troops were assigned to make the assault burnside of course was allowed to choose the division commander who was to lead the attack but instead of selecting the best officer for the purpose he allowed the division commanders to draw straws for the choice and the lot fell unfortunately upon ledley who was by far the least fitted for such an undertaking meade had joined grant at his bivouac near burnside's headquarters and every one was up long before daylight aiding in communicating final instructions and awaiting the firing of the mine now came the hour for the explosion half past three o'clock the general-in-chief was standing surrounded by his officers looking intently in the direction of the mine 
orderlies were holding the saddled horses near by not a word was spoken and the silence of death prevailed some minutes elapsed and our watches were anxiously consulted it was found to be ten minutes past the time and yet no sound from the mine ten minutes more and still no explosion more precious minutes elapsed and it became painfully evident that some neglect or accident had occurred daylight was now breaking and the formation of the troops for the assault would certainly be observed by the enemy officers had been sent to find out the cause of the delay and soon there came the information that the match had been applied at the hour designated but that the fuse had evidently failed at some point along the gallery another quarter of an hour passed and now the minutes seemed like ages the suspense was agonizing the whole movement depended upon that little spark which was to fire the mine and it had gone out the general-in-chief stood with his right hand placed against a tree his lips were compressed and his features wore an expression of profound anxiety but he uttered few words there was little to do but to wait now word came that the men of the forty eighth pennsylvania were not going to permit a failure not knowing whether the fuse had gone out or was only holding fire a search through the long gallery meant the probability of death to those who undertook it but lieutenant jacob doughty and sergeant henry reese of the forty eighth pennsylvania undertook to penetrate the long passageway and discover the cause of the failure they found that the fire had been interrupted at a point at which two sections of the fuse had been defectively spliced they promptly renewed the splice and as soon as they emerged from the gallery the match was again applied it was now twenty minutes to five over an hour past the appointed time the general had been looking at his watch and had just returned it to his pocket when suddenly there was a shock like that of an earthquake accompanied by a dull muffled roar then there rose two hundred feet in the air great columns of earth in the shape of a mighty inverted cone with forked tongues of flame darting through it like lightning playing through the clouds the mass seemed to be suspended for an instant in the heavens then there descended great blocks of clay rock sand timber guns carriages and men whose bodies exhibited every form of mutilation it appeared as if part of the debris was going to fall upon the front line of our troops and this created some confusion and a delay of ten minutes in forming them for the charge the crater made by the explosion was thirty feet deep sixty feet wide and a hundred and seventy feet long one hundred and ten cannon and fifty mortars opened fire from our lines soon fatal errors in carrying out the orders became painfully apparent the abatis had not been removed in the night and no adequate preparations had been made at the parapets for the troops to march over them the debouches were narrow and the men had to work their way out slowly when they reached the crater they found that its sides were so steep that it was almost impossible to climb out after once getting in ledley remained under cover in the rear the advance was without superior officers and the troops became confused some stopped to assist the confederates who were struggling out of the debris in which many of them were buried up to their necks the crater was soon filled with our disorganized men who were mixed up with the dead and dying of the enemy and tumbling aimlessly about or attempting to scramble up the other side the shouting screaming and cheering mingled with the roar of the artillery and the explosion of shells created a perfect pandemonium and the crater had become a cauldron of hell when it was found that the troops were accomplishing so little and that matters were so badly handled general grant quickly mounted his horse and calling to me said come with me i was soon in the saddle and followed by a single orderly we moved forward through some intervening woods to make our way as far as we could on horseback to the front of the attack it was now a little after half past five we soon came to a brigade lying upon its arms the general said to an officer near by who proved to be general henry g thomas a brigade commander who commands this brigade i do he replied springing up from the ground suddenly and manifesting no little surprise to find that the voice of the person addressing him was that of the general-in-chief well remarked the general why are you not moving in the officer replied my orders are to follow that brigade pointing to the one in front of him 
then after a pause he added will you give me the order to go in now no said general grant not wishing to interfere with the instructions of the division commander you may keep the orders you have and moved on to the front a pennsylvania regiment was now met with knapsacks piled on the ground and about to move to the attack the commanding officer made a salute and the general returned it by lifting his hat the men now recognized him and it was all the commander of the regiment could do to keep them from breaking out into a cheer although all noise had been forbidden the officer said to me some years later if the general had given me only a slight nod of the head that morning i should have been delighted but when i saw him at such a trying moment look at me and politely take off his hat it brought the tears to my eyes and sent a big lump into my throat the enemy had now rallied his men upon the line in the rear of the crater and there was heavy fighting going on between them and our advanced troops after proceeding a short distance i said general you cannot go much farther on horseback and i do not think you ought to expose yourself in this way i hope you will dismount as you will then be less of a target for the enemy's fire without saying a word he threw himself from his horse and handed the reins to the orderly who was then directed to take our animals back to the edge of the woods while we proceeded to the front on foot the general had by this time taken in the situation pretty fully and his object was to find the corps commander to have him try to bring some order out of the chaos which existed under inquiry it was ascertained that burnside was on our left and some distance farther in advance general grant now began to edge his way vigorously to the front through the lines of the assaulting columns as they poured out of the rifle pits and crawled over the obstructions it was one of the warmest days of the entire summer and even at this early hour of the morning the heat was suffocating the general wore his blue blouse and a pair of blue trousers in fact the uniform of a private soldier except the shoulder straps none of the men seemed to recognize him and they were no respecters of persons as they shoved and crowded to the front they little thought that the plainly dressed man who was elbowing his way past them so energetically and whose face was covered with dust and streaked with perspiration was the chief who had led them successfully from the wilderness to petersburg some officers were now seen standing in a field work to the left about three hundred yards distant and burnside was supposed to be one of the number to reach them by passing inside of our main line of works would have been a slow process as the ground was covered with obstacles and crowded with troops so to save valuable time the general climbed nimbly over the parapet landed in front of our earthworks and resolved to take the chances of the enemy's fire shots were now flying thick and fast and what with the fire of the enemy and the heat of the mid-morning southern sun there was an equatorial warmth about the undertaking the very recollection of it over thirty years after starts the perspiration scarcely a word was spoken in passing over the distance crossed sometimes the gait was a fast walk sometimes a dog trot as the shots shrieked through the air and ploughed the ground i held my breath in apprehension for the general's safety burnside was in the earthenwork for which we were heading and was not a little astonished to see the general approach on foot from such a direction climb over the parapet and make his way to where the corps commander was stationed grant said speaking rapidly the entire opportunity has been lost there is now no chance of success these troops must be immediately withdrawn it is slaughter to leave them here burnside was still hoping that something could be accomplished but the disobedience of orders and the general bungling had been so great that grant was convinced that the only thing to do now to stop the loss of life was to abandon the movement which a few hours before had promised every success the general then made his way on foot with no little difficulty to where our horses had been left mounted and returned to where we had parted from meade instructions were reiterated to burnside to withdraw the troops but he came to meade in person and insisted that his men could not be drawn out of the crater with safety that the enemy's guns now bore upon the only line of retreat and that there must be a passageway dug to protect them in crossing certain dangerous points both of these officers lost their tempers that morning although burnside was usually the personification of amiability and the scene between them was decidedly peppery and went far beyond confirming one's belief in the wealth and flexibility of the english language as a medium of personal dispute meade had sent burnside a note saying 
do you mean to say your officers and men will not obey your orders to advance if not what is the obstacle i wish to know the truth burnside replied i have never in any report said anything different from what i conceive to be the truth were it not insubordinate i would say that the latter remark of your note was unofficerlike and ungentlemanly it was quite evident that the conference was not going to resolve itself into a peace congress however both officers were manly enough afterward to express regret for what they had written and said under the excitement of the occasion although ledley had proved a failure other division commanders made gallant efforts to redeem the fortunes of the day but their men became disorganized and huddled together inextricably in the crater when the confusion was at its worst burnside threw in his division of colored troops who rushed gallantly into the crater but only added greater disorder to the men already crowded together there as a colored regiment was moving to the front in the midst of this scene of slaughter a white sergeant who was being carried to the rear with his leg shot off cried out now go in with a will boys there's enough of you to eat em all up a colored sergeant replied dat may be all so boss but the fact is we have not got dis de best kind of appetite for em dis morning the enemy soon brought to bear upon the crater a mortar fire which did serious execution there were many instances of superb courage but the most heroic bravery could not make amends for the utter inefficiency with which the troops had been handled by some of their officers it was two o'clock before all the survivors could be withdrawn the total losses amounted to about thirty eight hundred nearly fourteen hundred of whom were prisoners thus ended an operation conceived with rare ingenuity prepared with unusual forethought and executed up to the moment of the final assault with consummate skill and which yet resulted in absolute failure from sheer incapacity on the part of subordinates burnside had given written orders which were excellent in themselves but he failed entirely to enforce them when the general-in-chief and staff rode back to petersburg that day the trip was anything but cheerful for some time but little was said by him owing to his aversion to indulging in adverse criticisms of individuals which could not mend matters he did not dwell long upon the subject in his conversation simply remarking such an opportunity for carrying a fortified line i have never seen and never expect to see again if i had been a division commander or a corps commander i would have been at the front giving personal directions on the spot i believe that the men would have performed every duty required of them if they had been properly led and skilfully handled he had no unkind words for burnside but he felt that this disaster had greatly impaired that officer's usefulness two weeks afterward burnside was granted a leave of absence and did not serve again in the field general park one of his division commanders and an officer of eminent ability was placed in command of the ninth corps grant and burnside however did not break their amicable relations on account of this official action and their personal friendship continued as long as they both lived a surgeon told us a story one of the many echoes of the mine affair about a prisoner who had been dug out of the crater and carried to one of our field hospitals although his eyes were bunged and his face covered with bruises he was in an astonishingly amiable frame of mind and looked like a pugilistic hero of the prize ring coming up smiling in the twenty-seventh round he said i'll just bet you that after this i'll be the most unpopular man in my regiment you see i appeared to get started a little earlier than the other boys that had taken passage with me aboard that volcano and as i was coming down i met the rest of em a-going up and they looked as if they had kind of soured on me and yelled after me straggler general grant ordered the cavalry and a corps of infantry to start south at daylight the next morning before the enemy could recross the james river with instructions to destroy fifteen or twenty miles of the weldon railroad that night however information of the crossing of the potomac by early's troops compelled the general to change his plans and send sheridan to washington with two divisions of his cavalry early finding that pursuit had been abandoned and that the union forces had returned to washington put his army in motion and started to return to maryland his advance reached chambersburg pennsylvania on july thirty and finding no troops to oppose them 
burned the defenseless town and left three thousand women children and unarmed men homeless a week afterward this force while retreating was overtaken by averill and completely routed general grant now expressed himself as determined not only to prevent these incursions into maryland but to move a competent force down the valley of virginia and hold permanently that great granary upon which lee was drawing so largely for his supplies the most important thing was to find a commander equal to such an undertaking no one had commended himself more thoroughly to the general-in-chief for such a mission than sheridan and he telegraphed halleck to put sheridan in command of all the troops in the field and to give him instructions to pursue the enemy to the death sheridan reached washington on august three halleck telegraphed expressing some other views in regard to the disposition to be made of sheridan but they did not prevail on the evening of the third the president sent to general grant the following remarkable telegram which is so characteristic that it is given in full i have seen your dispatch in which you say i want sheridan put in command of all the troops in the field with instructions to put himself south of the enemy and follow him to the death wherever the enemy goes let our troops go also this i think is exactly right as to how our forces should move but please look over the dispatches you may have received from here even since you made that order and discover if you can that there is any idea in the head of any one here of putting our army south of the enemy or of following him to the death in any direction i repeat to you it will neither be done nor attempted unless you watch it every day and hour and force it a lincoln president it will be seen from this that the president was undoubtedly possessed of more courage than any of his advisers in washington and that he did not call for assistance to protect the capital but for troops and a competent leader to go after early and defeat him it is the language of a man who wanted an officer of grant's aggressiveness to force the fighting and send the troops after the enemy even if the capital had to be left temporarily without defence general grant received the president's dispatch at noon of august four and he left city point that night for hunter's headquarters at monocacy station in maryland reaching there the next evening august five he ordered all the troops in the vicinity to move that night to the valley of virginia the general had now a delicate duty to perform he had decided to put general sheridan in command of the active forces in the field but he was junior in rank to general hunter and in order to spare the feelings of hunter and not subject him to the mortification of being relieved from duty the general-in-chief suggested that he remain in command of the military department and that sheridan be given supreme control of the troops in the field hunter removed all embarrassment by saying that under the circumstances he deemed it better for the service that he should be relieved entirely from duty this unselfish offer was accepted and sheridan was telegraphed to come at once from washington to monocacy by a special train grant met him at the station and explained to him what was expected of him his present army consisted of nearly thirty thousand men including eight thousand cavalry early's army was about equal in numbers grant said to sheridan in his instructions do not hesitate to give commands to officers in whom you have confidence without regard to claims of others on account of rank what we want is prompt and active movements after the enemy in accordance with the instructions you already have i feel every confidence that you will do the best and will leave you as far as possible to act on your own judgment and not embarrass you with orders and instructions this dispatch was eminently characteristic of grant it affords a key to his method of dealing with his subordinates and explains one of the chief reasons why his commanders were so loyal to him they felt that they would be left to the exercise of an intelligent judgment that if they did their best even if they did not succeed they would never be made scapegoats and if they gained victories they would be given the sole credit for whatever they accomplished as soon as sheridan moved south the enemy was compelled to concentrate in front of him and the effect was what grant had predicted the termination of incursions into maryland the general returned to city point on august eighth 
rawlins had broken down in health from the labors and exposures of the campaign and had been given a leave of absence on august one in the hope that he might soon recuperate and return to duty but he was not able to join headquarters for two months already the seeds of consumption had been sown from which he died while secretary of war five years afterward he was greatly missed by every one at headquarters and his chief expressed no little anxiety about his illness although no one then thought that it was the beginning of a fatal disease an event occurred in the forenoon of august nine which looked for an instant as if the general-in-chief had returned to headquarters only to meet his death he was sitting in front of his tent surrounded by several staff officers general sharp the assistant provost marshal general had been telling him that he had a conviction that there were spies in the camp at city point and had proposed a plan for detecting and capturing them he had just left the general when at twenty minutes to twelve a terrific explosion shook the earth accompanied by a sound which vividly recalled the petersburg mine still fresh in the memory of every one present then there rained down upon the party a terrific shower of shells bullets boards and fragments of timber the general was surrounded by splinters and various kinds of ammunition but fortunately was not touched by any of the missiles babcock of the staff was slightly wounded in the right hand by a bullet one mounted orderly and several horses were instantly killed and three orderlies were wounded in a moment all was consternation on rushing to the edge of the bluff we found that the cause of the explosion was the blowing up of a boat loaded with ordnance stores which lay at the wharf at the foot of the hill much damage was done to the wharf and the boat was entirely destroyed all the laborers employed on it were killed and a number of men and horses near the landing were fatally injured the total casualties were forty-three killed and forty wounded the general was the only one of the party who remained unmoved he did not even leave his seat to run to the bluff with the others to see what had happened five minutes afterward he went to his writing-table and sent a telegram to washington notifying halleck of the occurrence no one could surmise the cause of the explosion and the general appointed me president of a board of officers to investigate the matter we spent several days in taking the testimony of all the people who were inside of the occurrence and used every possible means to probe the matter but as all the men aboard the boat had been killed we could obtain no satisfactory evidence it was attributed by most of those present to the careless handling of the ammunition by the laborers who were engaged in unloading it but there was a suspicion in the minds of many of us that it was the work of some emissaries of the enemy sent into the lines seven years after the war when i was serving with president grant as secretary a virginian called to see me at the white house to complain that the commissioner of patents was not treating him fairly in the matter of some patents he was endeavoring to procure in the course of the conversation in order to impress me with his skill as an inventor he communicated the fact that he had once devised an infernal machine which had been used with some success during the war and went on to say that it consisted of a small box filled with explosives with a clockwork attachment which could be set so as to cause an explosion at any given time that to prove the effectiveness of it he had passed into the union lines in company with a companion both dressed as laborers and succeeded in reaching city point knowing this to be the base of supplies by mingling with the laborers who were engaged in unloading the ordnance stores he and his companion succeeded in getting aboard the boat placing their infernal machine among the ammunition and setting the clockwork so that the explosion would occur in half an hour this enabled them to get to a sufficient distance from the place not to be suspected i told him that his efforts from his standpoint had been eminently successful at last after many years the mystery of the explosion was revealed this occurrence set the staff to thinking of the various forms of danger to which the general-in-chief was exposed and how easily he might be assassinated and we resolved that in addition to the ordinary guard mounted at the headquarters camp we would quietly arrange a detail of watchers from the members of the staff so that one officer would go on duty every night and keep a personal lookout in the vicinity of the general's tent this was faithfully carried out 
it had to be done secretly for if he had known of it he would without doubt have broken it up and insisted upon the staff officers going to bed after their hard day's work instead of keeping these vigils throughout the long dreary nights of the following winter the general never knew of this action until his second term of the presidency when he made the discovery through an accidental reference to it in his presence by a visitor who had heard of it he then expressed himself as feeling very much touched by the service which had been performed with a view to his personal protection End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of campaigning with grant by horace porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen the storming of newmarket heights a draft ordered battle of the weldon railroad battle of reams station general grant's family visit him the relations between grant and sherman a mission to sherman the captor of atlanta an evening with general thomas it was found that lee had sent a division of infantry and cavalry as far as culpeper to cooperate with early's forces and on august twelfth eighteen sixty four grant began a movement at petersburg intended to force the enemy to return his detached troops to that point hancock's corps was marched from petersburg to city point and there placed on steamboats the movement was to create the impression that these troops were to be sent to washington butler relayed the pontoon bridge and his forces crossed to deep bottom the same night august thirteenth the boats which carried hancock's corps were sent up the river and the troops disembarked on the north side of the james hancock was put in command of the movement general grant said in discussing the affair i am making this demonstration on the james not that i expect it to result in anything decisive in the way of crippling the enemy in battle my main object is to call troops from early and from the defences of petersburg if lee withdraws the bulk of his army from meade's front meade will have a good opportunity of making a movement to his left with one of his corps the fourteenth and fifteenth were spent in reconnoitring and manoeuvring and in making one successful assault on august sixteenth i was directed to go to hancock with important instructions and remain with his command that day this gave me an opportunity to participate in the engagements which took place early in the morning the movement began by sending out miles's brigade and gregg's cavalry which drove back a body of the enemy to a point only seven miles from richmond at ten o'clock a vigorous attack was made by burney's corps upon the works at fussell's mills the entrenchments were handsomely carried and three colors and nearly three hundred prisoners taken but the enemy soon returned in large force made a determined assault and compelled burney to abandon the works he had captured he succeeded however in holding the enemy's entrenched picket line in the meantime the enemy brought up a sufficient force to check the advance of gregg and miles and compel them to withdraw from their position our troops fell back in perfect order retiring by successive lines gregg took up a line on deep creek that evening the enemy made a heavy attack on him but only succeeded in forcing him back a short distance the fighting had been desperate and all the officers present had suffered greatly from their constant exposure to the heavy fire of the enemy in their efforts to hold the men to their work and add as much as possible to the success of the movements this day's fighting was known as the battle of newmarket heights in these engagements i was fortunate enough to be able to render service which was deemed to be of some importance by the general-in-chief who wrote to washington asking that i be breveted a lieutenant-colonel in the regular army for gallant and meritorious services in action and the appointment to that rank was made by the president as a result of these operations hill's command had been withdrawn from petersburg and sent to hancock's front and a division of longstreet's corps which had been under marching orders for the valley was detained general grant was now giving daily watchfulness and direction to four active armies in the field those of meade butler sheridan and sherman they constituted a dashing foreign hand with grant holding the reins these armies no longer moved like horses in a bulky team no two ever pulling together while some of them were at long distances from the others they were acting in harmony and cooperating with one another for the purpose of keeping the enemy constantly employed in their respective fronts to prevent him from concentrating his force against any particular army 
the enemy had short interior lines upon which to move and railroads for the prompt transportation of troops and it was only by these vigorous cooperative movements on the part of the union armies that the enemy was kept from practicing the fundamental principle of war namely concentrating the bulk of his forces against a fraction of those of the enemy the affairs of the country were now like a prairie in the season of fires as soon as the conflagration was extinguished in one place it immediately broke out in another while general grant was hourly employed in devising military movements to meet the situation in the field his advice and assistance were demanded for a grave state of affairs which had now arisen in the northern states a draft had been ordered by the president for the purpose of filling up our depleted regiments and the disloyal element at home was making it a pretext to embarrass the government in its prosecution of the war on august eleven halleck sent grant a confidential letter in which he said among other things of a disturbing nature pretty strong evidence is accumulating that there is a combination formed or forming to make a forcible resistance to the draft to enforce it may require the withdrawal of a very considerable number of troops from the field the evidence of this has increased very much within the last few days are not the appearances such that we ought to take in sail and prepare the ship for a storm general grant replied suggesting means for enforcing the draft without depleting the armies in the field and saying he was not going to break his hold where he was on the james on the evening of august seventeenth general grant was sitting in front of his quarters with several staff officers about him when the telegraph operator came over from his tent and handed him a dispatch he opened it and as he proceeded with the reading his face became suffused with smiles after he had finished it he broke into a hearty laugh we were curious to know what could produce so much merriment in the general in the midst of the trying circumstances which surrounded him he cast his eyes over the dispatch again and then remarked the president has more nerve than any of his advisers this is what he says after reading my reply to halleck's dispatch he then read aloud to us the following i have seen your dispatch expressing your unwillingness to break your hold where you are neither am i willing hold on with a bulldog grip and chew and choke as much as possible a lincoln throughout this period of activity at headquarters general grant was not unmindful of the rewards which were due to his generals for their achievements on august ten he had written to the secretary of war i think it but a just reward for services already rendered that general sherman be now appointed a major general and w s hancock and sheridan brigadiers in the regular army all these generals have proved their worthiness for this advancement sherman and hancock received their appointments on the twelfth and sheridan on the twentieth general grant was very much gratified that their cases had been acted upon so promptly warren moved out at dawn on august eighteenth in accordance with orders to a point three miles west of the left of the army of the potomac and began the work of tearing up the weldon railroad hard fighting ensued that day in which the enemy suffered severely lee hurried troops from north of the james to petersburg and in the afternoon of the nineteenth a large force turned a portion of warren's command and forced it to retire two divisions of park's corps had been ordered to support warren our troops were now reformed the lost ground was soon regained and the enemy fell back in great haste to his entrenchments and the position on the railroad was firmly held by warren's men general grant remained at city point this day in order to be in constant communication with hancock and butler as well as with meade when he heard of warren's success he telegraphed at once to meade i am pleased to see the promptness with which general warren attacked the enemy when he came out i hope he will not hesitate in such cases to abandon his lines and take every man to fight every battle and trust to regaining them afterward or to getting better he said after writing this dispatch meade and i have had to criticize warren pretty severely on several occasions for being slow and i wanted to be prompt to compliment him now that he has acted vigorously and handsomely in taking the offensive his corps being greatly exposed in its present position and knowing that the enemy would use all efforts to save the railroad warren on august twenty took up a position in rear of his line of battle the day before and entrenched 
all of hancock's corps was withdrawn from the north side of the james lee soon discovered this and hurried more troops back to petersburg on the morning of august twenty one hill's whole corps with a part of hoke's division and lee's cavalry attacked warren thirty pieces of artillery opened on him and at ten o'clock vigorous assaults were made but warren repulsed the enemy at all points and then advanced and captured several hundred prisoners the enemy had failed in his desperate efforts to recover the weldon railroad and he was now compelled to haul supplies by wagons around the break in order to make any use of that line of supplies on august twenty two gregg's division of cavalry and troops from hancock's corps were sent to reams's station seven miles south of warren's position and tore up three miles of the weldon railroad south of that place hancock discovered the enemy massing heavily in his front on the twenty fifth and concentrated his force at the station and took possession of some earthworks which had been constructed before at that place but which were badly laid out for the purpose of defence that afternoon several formidable assaults were directed against miles who was in command of barlow's division but they were handsomely repulsed at five p m hill's corps made a vigorous attack owing to the faulty construction of the earthworks hancock's command was exposed to a reverse fire which had an unfortunate effect upon the morale of the men a portion of miles's line finally gave way and three of our batteries of artillery were captured our troops were now exposed to attack both in flank and reverse and the position of hancock's command had become exceedingly critical but the superb conduct displayed by him and miles in rallying their forces saved the day by a gallant dash the enemy was soon swept back and one of our batteries and a portion of the entrenchments were retaken gibbon's division was driven from its entrenched position but it took up a new line and after hard fighting the further advance of the enemy was checked as the command was now seriously threatened in its present position and none of the reinforcements ordered up had arrived hancock's troops were withdrawn after dark hancock's want of success was due largely to the condition of his troops they had suffered great fatigue there had been heavy losses during the campaign particularly in officers and the command was composed largely of recruits and substitutes the casualties in this engagement in killed wounded and missing were two thousand seven hundred and forty two the number of guns lost nine the enemy's loss was larger than ours in killed and wounded but less in prisoners general miles who thirty-one years thereafter became general-in-chief of the army in all his brilliant career as a soldier never displayed more gallantry and ability than in this memorable engagement which is known in history as the battle of reams's station the enemy had subjected himself to heavy loss in a well-concerted attempt to regain possession of the weldon railroad which was of such vital importance to him but in this he had signally failed lee had been so constantly threatened or compelled to attack around petersburg and richmond that he had been entirely prevented from sending any forces to hood to be used against sherman mrs grant had come east with the children and colonel dent her brother was sent to meet them at philadelphia and bring them to city point to pay a visit to the general the children consisted of frederick d then fourteen years old ulysses s jr twelve nelly r nine and jesse r six nelly was born on the fourth of july and when a child an innocent deception had been practised upon her by her father in letting her believe that all the boisterous demonstrations and display of fireworks on independence day were in honour of her birthday the general was exceedingly fond of his family and his meeting with them afforded him the happiest day he had seen since they parted they were comfortably lodged aboard the headquarters steamboat but spent most of their time in camp the morning after their arrival when i stepped into the general's tent i found him in his shirt-sleeves engaged in a rough-and-tumble wrestling match with the two older boys he had become red in the face and seemed nearly out of breath from the exertion the lads had just tripped him up and he was on his knees on the floor grappling with the youngsters and joining in their merry laughter as if he were a boy again himself i had several dispatches in my hand and when he saw that i had come on business he disentangled himself after some difficulty from the young combatants rose to his feet 
brushed the dust off his knees with his hand and said in a sort of apologetic manner ah you know my weakness my children and my horses the children often romped with him and he joined in their frolics as if they were all playmates together the younger ones would hang about his neck while he was riding making a terrible mess of his papers and turning everything in his tent into a toy but they were never once reproved for any innocent sport they were governed solely by an appeal to their affections they were always respectful and never failed to render strict obedience to their father when he told them seriously what he wanted them to do mrs grant formerly miss julia dent was four years younger than the general she had been educated in professor moreau's finishing school in st louis one of the best institutions of instruction in its day and was a woman of much general intelligence and exceedingly well informed upon all public matters she was noted for her amiability her cheerful disposition and her extreme cordiality of manner she was soon upon terms of intimacy with all the members of the staff and was quick to win the respect and esteem of every one at headquarters she visited any officers or soldiers who were sick went to the cook and suggested delicacies for their comfort took her meals with the mess kept up a pleasant run of conversation at the table and added greatly to the cheerfulness of headquarters she had visited her husband several times in the front when he was winning his victories in the west and had learned perfectly how to adapt herself to camp life she and the general were a perfect darby and joan they would seek a quiet corner of his quarters of an evening and sit with her hand in his manifesting the most ardent devotion and if a staff officer came accidentally upon them they would look as bashful as two young lovers spied upon in the scenes of their courtship in speaking of the general to others his wife usually referred to him as mr grant from force of habit formed before the war in addressing him she said ulyss and when they were alone or no one was present except an intimate friend of the family she applied a pet name which she had adopted after the capture of vicksburg and called him victor sometimes the general would tease the children good-naturedly by examining them about their studies putting to them all sorts of puzzling mathematical questions and asking them to spell tongue-splitting words of half a dozen syllables mrs grant would at times put on an air of mock earnestness and insist upon the general telling her all of the details of the next movement he intended to make he would then proceed to give her a fanciful description of an imaginary campaign in which he would name impossible figures as to the number of the troops inextricably confuse the geography of the country and trace out a plan of marvellously complicated movements in a manner that was often exceedingly droll no family could have been happier in their relations there was never a selfish act committed or an ill-natured word uttered by any member of the household and their daily life was altogether beautiful in its charming simplicity and its deep affection a little before nine o'clock on the evening of september four while the general was having a quiet smoke in front of his tent and discussing the campaign in georgia a dispatch came from sherman announcing the capture of atlanta which had occurred on september second it was immediately read aloud to the staff and after discussing the news for a few minutes and uttering many words in praise of sherman the general wrote the following reply i have just received your dispatch announcing the capture of atlanta in honor of your great victory i have ordered a salute to be fired with shotted guns from every battery bearing upon the enemy the salute will be fired within an hour amid great rejoicing in the meantime the glad tidings had been telegraphed to meade and butler with directions to fire the salute and not long afterward the roar of artillery communicated the joyful news of victory throughout our army and bore sad tidings to the ranks of the enemy an answer was received from sherman in which he said i have received your dispatch and will communicate it to the troops in general orders i have always felt that you would take personally more pleasure in my success than in your own and i reciprocate the feeling to the fullest extent grant then wrote to sherman i feel that you have accomplished the most gigantic undertaking given to henry general in this war with a skill and ability which will be acknowledged in history as unsurpassed if not unequalled 
it gives me as much pleasure to record this in your favor as it would in favor of any living man myself included this correspondence and the unmeasured praise which was given to sherman at this time by the general-in-chief in his dispatches and conversations afford additional evidences of his constant readiness to give all due praise to his subordinates for any successful work which they accomplished he was entirely unselfish in his relations with them and never tired of taking up the cudgels in their defence if any one criticised them unjustly the above correspondence with sherman recalls the letters which were interchanged between them after general grant's successes in the west the general wrote to sherman at that time what i want is to express my thanks to you and mcpherson as the men to whom above all others i feel indebted for whatever i have had of success how far your advice and assistance have been of help to me you know how far your execution of whatever has been given to you to do entitles you to the reward i am receiving you cannot know as well as i i feel all the gratitude this letter would express giving it the most flattering construction sherman wrote a no less manly letter in reply after insisting that general grant assigned to his subordinates too large a share of merit he went on to say i believe you to be as brave patriotic and just as the great prototype washington as unselfish and kind-hearted and honest as a man should be but the chief characteristic is the simple faith in success you have always manifested which i can liken to nothing else than the faith a christian has in the saviour i knew wherever i was that you thought of me and if i got in a tight place you would help me out if alive the noble sentiments expressed in this and similar correspondence were the bright spots which served to relieve the gloomy picture of desolating war now that sherman had captured atlanta the question at once arose as to what his next move should be and a discussion took place at general grant's headquarters as to the advisability of a march to the sea such a movement had been referred to in a dispatch from grant to halleck as early as july fifteen saying if he sherman can supply himself once with ordnance and quartermaster stores and partially with subsistence he will find no difficulty in staying until a permanent line can be opened with the south coast on august thirteen sherman communicated with general grant about the practicability of cutting loose from his base and shifting his army to the alabama river or striking out for st mark's florida or for savannah further correspondence took place between the two generals after sherman had entered atlanta the subject was one in which the members of the staff became deeply interested maps were pored over daily and most intelligent discussions were carried on as to the feasibility of sherman's army making a march to the sea-coast and the point upon which his movement should be directed on september twelfth general grant called me into his tent turned his chair around from the table at which he had been sitting lighted a fresh cigar and began a conversation by saying sherman and i have exchanged ideas regarding his next movement about as far as we can by correspondence and i have been thinking that it would be well for you to start for atlanta to-morrow and talk over with him the whole subject of his next campaign we have debated it so much here that you know my views thoroughly and can answer any of sherman's questions as to what i think in reference to the contemplated movement and the action which should be taken in the various contingencies which may arise sherman's suggestions are excellent and no one is better fitted for carrying them out i can comply with his views in regard to meeting him with ample supplies at any point on the sea-coast which it may be decided to have him strike for you can tell him that i am going to send an expedition against wilmington north carolina landing the troops on the coast north of fort fisher and with the efficient cooperation of the navy we will no doubt get control of wilmington harbor by the time he reaches and captures other points on the sea-coast sherman has made a splendid campaign and the more i reflect upon it the more merit i see in it i do not want to hamper him any more in the future than in the past with detailed instructions i want him to carry out his ideas freely in the coming movement and to have all the credit of his success of this success i have no doubt i will write sherman a letter which you can take to him 
the general then turned to his writing-table and retaining between his lips the cigar which he had been smoking wrote the communication after reading it over aloud he handed it to me to take to atlanta it said among other things colonel porter will explain to you the exact condition of affairs here better than i can do in the limits of a letter my object now in sending a staff officer is not so much to suggest operations for you as to get your views and have plans matured by the time everything can be got ready it will probably be the fifth of october before any of the plans herein indicated will be executed i started the next day on this mission going by way of cincinnati and louisville and after many tedious interruptions from the crowded state of traffic by rail south of the latter place and being once thrown from the track i reached chattanooga on the afternoon of september nineteen from there to atlanta is one hundred and fifty miles guerrillas were active along the line of the road numerous attempts had recently been made to wreck the trains and they were run as far as practicable by daylight being anxious to reach general sherman with all dispatch i started forward that night on a freight train rumors of approaching guerrillas were numerous but like many other campaign reports they were unfounded and i arrived in atlanta safely the next forenoon upon this night trip i passed over the battlefield of chickamauga on the anniversary of the sanguinary engagement in which i had participated the year before and all of its exciting features were vividly recalled upon reaching atlanta i went at once to general sherman's headquarters my mind was naturally wrought up to a high degree of curiosity to see the famous soldier of the west whom i had never met he had taken up his quarters in a comfortable brick house belonging to a judge lyons opposite the courthouse square as i approached i saw the captor of atlanta on the porch sitting tilted back in a large armchair reading a newspaper his coat was unbuttoned his black felt hat slouched over his brow and on his feet were a pair of slippers very much down at the heels he was in the prime of life and in the perfection of physical health he was just forty-four years of age and almost at the summit of his military fame with his large frame tall gaunt form restless hazel eyes aquiline nose bronzed face and crisp beard he looked the picture of a grim-visaged war my coming had been announced to him by telegraph and he was expecting my arrival at this time i approached him introduced myself and handed him general grant's letter he tilted forward in his chair crumpled the newspaper in his left hand while with his right he shook hands cordially then pushed a chair forward and invited me to sit down his reception was exceedingly cordial and his manner exhibited all the personal peculiarities which general grant in speaking of him had so often described after reading general grant's letter he entered at once upon an animated discussion of the military situation east and west and as he waxed more intense in his manner the nervous energy of his nature soon began to manifest itself he twice rose from his chair and sat down again twisted the newspaper into every conceivable shape and from time to time drew first one foot and then the other out of its slipper and followed up the movement by shoving out his leg so that the foot could recapture the slipper and thrust itself into it again he exhibited a strong individuality in every movement and there was a peculiar energy of manner in uttering the crisp words and epigrammatic phrases which fell from his lips as rapidly as shots from a magazine gun i soon realized that he was one of the most dramatic and picturesque characters of the war he asked a great deal about the armies of the east and spoke of the avidity with which he read all accounts of the desperate campaigns they were waging he said i knew grant would make the fur fly when he started down through virginia wherever he is the enemy will never find any trouble about getting up a fight he has all the tenacity of a scotch terrier that he will accomplish his whole purpose i have never had a doubt i know well the immense advantage which the enemy has in acting on the defensive in a peculiarly defensive country falling back on his supplies when we are moving away from ours taking advantage of every river hill forest and swamp to hold us at bay and entrenching every night behind fortified lines to make himself safe from attack 
grant ought to have an army more than twice the size of that of the enemy in order to make matters at all equal in virginia when grant cried forward after the battle of the wilderness i said this is the grandest act of his life now i feel that the rebellion will be crushed i wrote him saying it was a bold order to give and full of significance that it showed the metal of which he was made and if wellington could have heard it he would have jumped out of his boots the terms of grant's dispatch in reply to the announcement of the capture of atlanta gave us great satisfaction here i took that and the noble letter written by president lincoln and published them in general orders and they did much to encourage the troops and make them feel that their hard work was appreciated by those highest in command after a while lunch was announced and the general invited me to his mess consisting of himself and his personal staff among the latter i met some of my old army friends whom i was much gratified to see again the general's mess was established in the dining-room of the house he occupied and was about as democratic as grant's the officers came and went as their duties required and meals were eaten without the slightest ceremony after we were seated at the table the general said i don't suppose we have anything half as good to eat out here as you fellows in the east have you have big rivers upon which you can bring up shellfish and lots of things that we don't have here where everything has to come over a single track railroad more than three hundred miles long and you bet we don't spare any cars for luxuries it is all we can do to get the necessaries down this far however here is some pretty fair beef and there are plenty of potatoes pointing to the dishes and they are good enough for anybody we did get a little short of rations at times on the march down here and one of my staff told me a good story of what one of the men had to say about it an officer found him eating a persimmon that he had picked up and cried out to him don't eat that it's not good for you i'm not eatin it cause it's good was the reply i'm tryin to pucker up my stomach so as to fit the size of the rations uncle billy sherman's a givin us after lunch we repaired to a room in the house which the general used for his office and there went into an elaborate discussion of the purpose of my visit he said i am more than ever of the opinion that there ought to be some definite objective point or points decided upon before i move farther into this country sweeping around generally through georgia for the purpose of inflicting damage would not be good generalship i want to strike out for the sea now that our people have secured mobile bay they might be able to send a force up to columbus that would be of great assistance to me in penetrating farther into this state but unless canby is largely reinforced he will probably have as much as he can do at present in taking care of the rebels west of the mississippi if after grant takes wilmington he could with the cooperation of the navy get hold of savannah and open the savannah river up to the neighborhood of augusta i would feel pretty safe in picking up the bulk of this army and moving east subsisting off the country i could move to milledgeville and threaten both macon and augusta and by making feints i could maneuver the enemy out of augusta i can subsist my army upon the country as long as i can keep moving but if i should have to stop and fight battles the difficulty would be greatly increased there is no telling what hood will do whether he will follow me and contest my march eastward or whether he will start north with his whole army thinking there will not be any adequate force to oppose him and that he can carry the war as far north as kentucky i don't care much which he does i would rather have him start north though and i would be willing to give him a free ticket and pay his expenses if he would decide to take that horn of the dilemma i could send enough of this army to delay his progress until our troops scattered through the west could be concentrated in sufficient force to destroy him then with the bulk of my army i could cut a swath through to the sea divide the confederacy in two and be able to move up in the rear of lee or do almost anything else that grant might require of me both jeff davis according to the tone of his recent speeches and hood want me to fall back that is just the reason why i want to go forward the general then went to a long discussion of the details which would have to be carried out under the several contingencies which might occur 
he said in any emergency i should probably want to designate a couple of points on the coast where i could reach the sea as compelled by circumstances and a fleet of provisions ought to be sent to each one of the points so that i would be sure of having supplies awaiting me i told him that this had been discussed by general grant and it was his intention to make ample provisions of that nature the general said further you know when i cut loose from my communications you will not hear anything from me direct and grant will have to learn of my whereabouts and the points where i reach the coast by means of scouts if we can get any through the country and possibly depend largely upon the news obtained from rebel newspapers i suppose you get these papers through the lines just as we do here i said yes and i think more readily the enemy is always eager to get the new york papers and as we receive them daily we exchange them for richmond and petersburg papers and obtain in that way much news that is valuable there will be no difficulty in hearing of your movements almost daily at the close of the conversation i told the general i was anxious to get back to headquarters as soon as it would suit his convenience he told me to stay a couple of days saying he would talk matters over further and would write some communications for general grant a report and also a list of the names of officers whom he wished to have promoted if it could be prepared in time i was invited to share the quarters of one of the staff officers and spent a couple of days very advantageously in looking over the captured city and learning many points of interest regarding the marvellous campaign which had secured it that evening i paid a visit to my old commanding officer general george h thomas who had quartered himself in a house on peachtree street now known as the leyden house and passed a very pleasant hour with him the house was surrounded by a broad porch supported by rows of fluted columns and was very commodious the meeting revived a great many stories of the chickamauga campaign the general said in the course of the conversation do you remember that jackass that looked over the fence one day when we were passing along a road near the tennessee river he pricked up his ears and brayed until he threatened to deafen everybody within a mile of him and when he stopped and a dead silence followed a soldier quietly remarked boys did you hear him purr i thought that was about the loudest specimen of a purr i had ever heard then the general lay back in his chair and shook with laughter at the recollection while grave in manner and leonine in appearance he had a great deal more fun in him than is generally supposed when quartered at murfreesboro tennessee the year before a piano had been secured and it was the custom to have musical entertainments in the evening at general headquarters there were some capital voices among the officers and no end of comic songs at hand and these with the recitations and improvisations which were contributed made up a series of variety performances which became quite celebrated general thomas was a constant attendant and would nod approval at the efforts of the performers and beat time to the music and when anything particularly comical took place he would roll from side to side and nearly choke with merriment that day sherman wrote to grant i have the honor to acknowledge at the hands of lieutenant colonel porter of your staff your letter of september twelfth and accept with thanks the honorable and kindly mention of the services of this army in the great cause in which we are engaged then followed three or four pages closing with the sentence i will have a long talk with colonel porter and tell him everything that may occur to me of interest to you in the meantime know that i admire your dogged perseverance and pluck more than ever if you can whip lee and i can march to the atlantic i think uncle abe will give us a twenty days leave of absence to see the young folks two days later i started back to city point and reached there september twenty seven chapter eighteen